and to send a message faster than the speed of light. I believe that, that our government has already done it. I really, I really believe that there is so much evidence when you study the original solid-state physics masters in the late 1900s. In the late 1900s, Einstein, Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, Dirac, they were all working on crystals, all of them. And nobody knows this. You have to pull out these old dusty books to, to learn the history of solid-state electronics and how it all evolved, how everything in your computer has a crystal in it. And, and people think crystals are, are hooky science. I mean, I'm raising human body voltage and getting increased telepathy on, on many, many of the people who wear my, my crystal energy pendants. Why is that happening? Well, the same thing happens in a radio. You see, a radio has a transistor in it, and the transistor uses germanium crystal, and it uses conductive material to amplify the very, very weak information of music in the human voice to amplify it so that you can actually hear it. Well, the human body, our bones are calcium, phosphorus, and silica. Okay, well, that's a crystal. Mm -hmm. You see, calcium is an electrolyte. You can make a calcium ion battery. You can make a magnesium ion battery. You can make a lithium ion battery if you mix it with some silica, which is crystal. And, in fact, the first transistors that William Shockley developed were crystal doped with phosphorus. They had to chemically add the phosphorus. Well, that's in your bones. Your bones are solid-state crystals, and you're surrounded by a liquid crystal, which is sodium, potassium, and, and minerals that are floating around in the water content of your body. And then you have all these little microorganisms in you that, that interface with that liquid and solid state crystal to send and receive telepathic messages. So we really work the same way that, that radios do. The first transistors that worked were solid state crystals. All right, let's move on to some calls here, yeah, David. Liquid, all right? liquid. So I don't doubt what you're saying. But in layman's terms, my question is, does this mean that we're going to be able to communicate with extraterrestrials down the road? Now, now that's an interesting and question, David. Well... In light of the news that neutrinos, which have solid mass, like electrons, um, going faster than the speed of light, that is really new news, and that was previously thought to be impossible. But when you're sending information in the electromagnetic spectrum, like we do on radio waves, they travel at 186,282 miles per second. However, the physicist I mentioned earlier, Raymond Chow at Berkeley, got those, those light waves to go faster than the speed of light using crisps and, and lasers. So... So with all of that, it is, there's no doubt that it's even technologically feasible. But there's new studies being done at European universities I've read about recently, to, to answer your question more directly, where they actually claim they did send a faster-than-light signal using nuclear harmonic resonance techniques, which is, which is really similar to what I'm doing. But, you know, I'm using the mathematical resonance of my target, my distant star system, which is, which is a very secret type of mathematics to produce a harmonic. You see, when we send out a radio transmission, there's no harmonics involved in it at all. There may be harmonics in the music or the human voice, but the transmitter itself is not harmonic in any way. My, my transmitter is. It is very harmonic in its, in, its, in its mathematics. We're only interested in, in tagging information, voices and pictures and, and music on a radio wave traveling at the speed of light. So there are universities now in Europe that they claim to have sent an information signal many, many times faster than the speed of light. So we will be talking to extraterrestrials. In fact, this is really, really a, an amazing moment in our history because what the Mayan calendar predicts, the ninth level of the Mayan, the Mayan pyramid, the eighth level was, was global consciousness. We would reach this global consciousness, which we did, I think, in the seventh or eighth level of the pyramid, which is the Internet. And we now have super fast communication. Anybody can be communicating on the Internet at these amazing speeds and super learning and researching things and not having to go to the library. But the ninth level says we're going to reach galactic consciousness, galactic communication. And the only way we're going to reach galactic communication is faster than light <coughs> telecommunications. And we're already seeing, you know, my transmitter is one experimental transmitter that I believe is working. But there are there are ways to advance this technology and so that you can actually get and receive a picture from your, your target. So we're, we're heading in that direction. It's really happening. This is not, what I'm saying is not, um, <clears throat> it's not a science fiction movie. This is, this is a real experimentation that's being done. All right, let's go. Hey, uh, uh, George and uh, David, David, have you ever seen uh, an experiment where they use uh, lasers and uh, polarized glass? So anyway, um, yeah. uh, okay, let me explain real quick. Uh, they they use, start off with thin glass and a laser, and they shoot it through the glass, and uh, then they get thicker and thicker, and more of the light is reflected, and suddenly uh, all of it's reflected. Then a little bit thicker, and it becomes 100% transparent. And they do this several times, and finally um, what happens is they, shoot, they get a little bit thicker, and they shoot it through there, and the light actually comes out quicker than it went in, a couple of milliseconds quicker. Have you ever seen that experiment? 
I haven't seen the experiment, but it sounds very similar to Raymond Chow's faster than light photons going through a, a quartz barrier. And, you know, glass is silica, even though it doesn't have the same geometry as quartz, it is the same stuff. So that, that's very fascinating. That's time travel. They use a, the light actually uh, goes faster than the speed of light through the glass. Yeah, because when, when you put a barrier in the path of the light, it, if the geometry is right, it will quantum tunnel in a higher frequency spin, and it will uh, not atomic spin, but in, in, a, in a super frequency spin state, and that's why it accelerates. I mean, that's all in my galactic clock model. I put it in the year 2000. So, David, how often do you transmit to them? Well, you know, I did the one in August of 2010, and then there was a long break, and then because we know we have a, a newborn baby girl who, who took over our lives. <laughs> And so we just did it again, and my wife is always saying, you know, we got to send them another message, and we got to send them another message because we have more questions. And we've been so successful with it. And I, I'm very strict, George. If I hear my own mind thinking it's getting a message, I reject that. It has to be audible, a true locution or, or voice, or it has to come through like this particular sensor in the magnetic spectrum only. And radio transmissions don't show up in the magnetic spectrum only. If I hold my trifold meter in front of my internet antenna in magnetic mode, nothing happens. But if I put it in microwave mode, I get a signal. Well, that day, there was no microwave signal. There was only a magnetic signal. And it was, it was a very structured wave. So that is highly unusual. It, there's no technology out there that can do that over your property that I know of and, and not be in the microwave spectrum. I just, I just can't imagine what it was. I wasn't satisfied that, of course, that NASA was going to tell us the truth about Ellen and, and several other, you know, um, asteroid or comet-like bodies entering the solar system all at the same time. It's this great epic of tonight, September 27th. So I had built what I believe to be a faster-than-light radio transmitter. It does not use radio waves. It uses quantum technology to send a message, a series of questions that I recorded on a CD and I plugged it in just like people do at radio stations with music, and I sent it out on the transmitter, transmitter several times on August the 21st in the wee hours of the morning, going from the 20th to the 21st. And I asked a distant star system group where I sent the message to. Now, when we send a radio signal out into space, when the Beatles song, you know, Across the Universe was broadcast, Polaris, the Northern Star, they send it like a cannon, you know, like firing a beam and hoping it's going to get there. Get there. I, I know, of course, that doesn't work, and of course, that's not how extraterrestrials are doing this. And I wanted to know if there's intelligence behind Comet Elenine, as Richard Hoagland, you know, proposed, then somebody out there knows about it, and there's no way you're going to get an answer from anybody on Earth if we even know about it. And so I had, last August, 2010, sent my wife singing a jazz song called, um, you know, Flying You to the Moon through the transmitter. And I really didn't know if it was going to work. This was 2010, because I do it again on August the 21st, which is my 50th birthday this mm -hmm. year. Okay. And that is the date when Comet Elenin started breaking up, supposedly breaking up, in concert with my transmission. You broke it up. <laughs> well, that, that it really gets amazing what starts to happen. So in the middle of the night on August the 22nd, I'm sorry, the, the, you know, coming into the 21st in 2010, I am awoken. It's like someone tore the fabric of space-time. I hear this loud voice. They congratulations, we received your message loud and clear. This was in 2010, August 21st. And I went, oh, my God, I jumped out of bed and I told my wife they heard the jazz song. It worked. The harmonic transmitter sent the message to the Pleiades star system 444 light years away, faster than the speed of light. Said, this is impossible. So let's get up before my birthday is over and let's record a series of questions to them, which we did in the year 2010. And I've never talked about this anywhere because it, it's, it's kind of scary to think that this... It's a little out there, David. It's, it's way out there to think who's going to believe you and... Who can send messages to a star system that far away and get an answer within a day? That, that just doesn't seem possible. Or are there Pleiadian ships in our solar system? Now, before we go to Ellen, and just on point, remember that the first UFO I saw in Berkeley in 1960 with over 100 witnesses that day clearly appeared to me and showed me how their craft worked and told me they were Pleiadians. This is before the Billy Myers story ever broke, because his story starts in the early 70s. This is 1967, 68. So I had a relationship with that star system as a child, and I always wanted to contact him. So we did it again, believe it or not. And, and the answers I got back that year are so stunning, I, I can't go into that tonight. Well, we're going to get into some of them. What does this machine look like that you built? Well, kind of paint us a picture here. I, I, I don't want to give away the technology, but I can tell you a little bit to kind of tease people who are techies out there a little bit. In biological systems, there is a function that acts as a trigger that causes something mysterious in, in quantum systems, you know, the atom is smaller, to send these signals out faster than the speed of light. The physicist named Elaine Aspects in, in the 1990s separates the electron and the positron over any distance, and using atomic clocks, they communicate faster, way faster than the speed of light, in fact, almost instantaneously. And, of course, the same thing happens in plants. 
The problem, when William Shockley was inventing the transistor, before he got it to work in a dry environment, he was so frustrated he couldn't get it to work, he stuck it in water. And what is in water are tons of little microbes and living organisms you know, floating around under the microscope. There was a Russian physicist named Alexander Dzhevsky who noticed that these little microorganisms in water would go crazy the moment a solar flare was leaving the sun 8.3 minutes before the light would arrive at Earth. He knew that these little biological critters could communicate faster than light. When William Shockley thought a transistor to work in water, he said, we can't use water because it will dry up. We've got to get this to work without water. So all the research into liquid crystals as opposed to solid state crystal was abandoned. Now that's a little teaser there because what I did involves living liquid crystals. Are you going to patent this idea, David? Well, well, I actually have tested it and tested it with several other people and, you know, who, who used the technology, who recorded their voice, and we sent messages out, and they had an experience that night. And these are people who really didn't even believe in it that much. So you know, I was ready to tell Gary Schwartz with his Project Sophia that, you know, Gary, you know, if you want to record a series of questions, I'll send it out and you can tell me if you're going to have an experience. But, you know, a whole year passed. I didn't, you know, I thought there's no way anyone's going to believe it because they want to see an answer come back in the form of a radio signal, and that's not how this stuff works. But the answer comes back kind of in your mind. In your well, mind. no, it, it, it's extremely loud. It's not like a, um, it's not like their mind getting a telepathic message. I heard this voice loud and clear. Would, would somebody else have heard it had they been in your room? Well, my wife is in my room. Did she hear it? She didn't hear it, but she had an experience this year. I mean, how can it be so loud and no one else can hear it? Well, imagine when Moses used the, the Ark of the Covenant and he was communicating with his God. You know, John Peterson has done a lot of duplication mm -hmm. on rebuilding the Ark of the Covenant. There are no speakers in the Ark of the Covenant, yet it has electrical capacitance. It has properties of a transistor. There is a lot of evidence that it was a telecommunications device between Moses and his God. But well, how they, they, maybe they were on your frequency somehow. Because it's biological, George. See, there, there's a biological attachment to the electronic components in my transmitter. And the biological component means that it's the biological critters, these little microorganisms, that actually are the, are the sensors that interface with the, with the electronic components that we can amplify the signal with. And so it's really the answer is going to come into biology first. There may be a way that I can amplify the biological signal and get a real physical response. Well, I did get a physical response, and this is what's exciting. What did they say to you exactly? Well, that was the year 2010. Now, this year it's even more stunning because on August 21st, in the wee hours, it's coming in from the 20th, I had no idea that, that Ellen was about to break up. That no, I, nobody did, David. Nobody did. I sent out a series of questions to a star, a star group that's so far away from the solar system it's almost irrelevant. But we asked them, you know, is the October 28, 2011 date still on? And, and also about the alignment of September 27th, which is today, in common element. When we sent it out on August 22nd, the very next day, in the series of questions I asked them, I asked them to please appear to us in a way that doesn't compromise your your life. We know that we have very advanced beam weapons in this country, and I know who built them, and I know all about the beam weapons. I know we shoot down flying saucers, and I know they have a very powerful case for the space shuttle Columbia being shot down and photographic evidence from NASA. So we said to them, how can you appear to us in a way that doesn't compromise your security? Well, August 22nd shows up, and George, I mean, I have sensors. I have sensors all over my house. I live in Sedona, Arizona. There's nobody. There's no high-tension power lines around here. And there's one particular sensor is a trifold meter in magnetic mode, not radio and microwave mode. In radio and microwave mode, you can pick up your cell phone signal. You can pick up um, the microwave tra transmission for the, from the radar, um, from the airport. You can see tiny movement. In magnetic mode, now, this is really key because my transmitter uses magnetic resonance with a biological component. Now, that's giving away a lot of information. There's a whole other component that you need to understand mathematically about your sending it to your target. You see, the human heart produces a magnetic field, and the human heart does not produce radio waves. It doesn't produce microwaves. Yet our biological system telepathically sends messages faster than the speed of light through any barrier, through rock, concrete, where cell phone transmissions can't penetrate. It, it could be instant. They are instant over the distances we're talking about. But it's not the magnetic component that in the body that is faster than light. The magnetic component is the trigger to another component in the quantum level of biology. All right, but are you saying, David, that you've invented a device yes. to allow you to communicate with extraterrestrials? Yes, faster than the speed of light. So the next day, in magnetic mode only, where you never get signals, you never get intelligent signals, my meter starts going off from a background level of one and a half microtesels, and I have my meter on right now in front of me. I've watched this meter for years. It has never done this, ever. And it's never done it since. It goes from one and a half microtesels to three, and it holds it three for three seconds, drops down to one and a half, 
for three seconds. Uh, explain what that means to us. That is a six-second square wave with perfect structure repeating for over 10 hours. It went till just before midnight on the 22nd of August and suddenly stopped. And within minutes, there's an earthquake in Colorado, and later that day, there's an earthquake in Virginia. Now, ah. now that is incredible because the signal stops and it's never repeated. I've never seen it again, but it has threes and sixes, threes and sixes built into it. And if you know ancient Babylonian math... The, the well, no, I don't. <laughs> very Nor should I be expected to. We have five fingers, right? So, you know, the decimal system is 10 base math. You do 10 plus 10 plus 10, and then you, you, know, you eventually get to 100 and 1,000 and 10,000. We're on the decimal system now. The ancient Babylonians were on the six base math system. So they, if they had six fingers, they just count six as one, six, two, six, three, six. And that's how you got 60 seconds in a minute, 60 uh, heartbeats in a minute, and you got, you know, 12 hours in a day is two sixes. You see, that's a six base math system. The only, the only civilizations that used six base math systems were, were probably the builders of the Great Pyramids and the, and the early, early stone builders. So I thought, what is, and we don't produce square waves where the peak of the wave lasts for three seconds. The waves go up and down, up and down. 